Is juror number seven, Rochelle Nice, a stealth juror? In other words, did she lie to get on the Peterson murder case? Or is this a witch hunt by Scott Peterson? It's a fishing expedition that he's alleging and claiming that Rochelle Nice had a bias against him. Therefore, he didn't get a right to a fair trial, so his convictions can be thrown out. Stelter or witch hunt? So, hi there. I'm Michelle Hagan, and I'm a legal analyst and former prosecutor. You may recognize me. I provided a lot of legal analysis on the Elizabeth Holmes fraud trial and the Ghislaine Maxwell trial and several others. So many of you have reached out and asked, where can we find more of your legal analysis? Well, here's the channel, channel that I created to provide you with more legal analysis. Again, it's just my opinion. I welcome your comments and your feedback because I want to know what you think. So. Let's take a look at the declaration. Let's hear what Rochelle Nice or see what Rochelle Nice in her declaration, how she explains what happened. And also we're going to look at the particular questions on the juror questionnaire, which she answered um, and didn't give the information that Peterson says shows that she concealed. Therefore, she was biased and his conviction should be thrown out. Okay, so let's take a look at, uh, let's see what I'll look at first here. Let's go with, okay, here are the questions. This is from, this is from a court records that were filed. It's part of the um, prosecution's return uh, filing, and this relates to the questions. So here are the particular questions that she was asked, or the questions in controversy, let's put it that way. These are the questions that she was asked, as well as all the other jurors, in the written questionnaire that they were given during the jury selection process in the Peterson case. So here are the questions that she answered no to. And just to give you a little background, she was involved in a prior domestic violence case with a boyfriend. She had, fi she had filed a petition requesting a restraining order against the boyfriend's ex-girlfriend and none of that was disclosed in her juror questionnaire and her written questionnaire. So here are the questions. I want to look at the questions first and then we'll look at what she said about what happened in her declaration. Okay, so the first question, have you been involved in a lawsuit? Yes or no? A lawsuit. She was involved in a domestic violence. She was the victim in a domestic violence case. She was the petitioner in a restraining order. Does that amount to a lawsuit? And what does she say about that? She answered no. Have you ever participated in a trial as a party witness or interested observer? She didn't answer this question because she didn't think it was relevant because she hadn't been a plaintiff or a defendant. Number 74, have you or any member of your family or close friends ever been a victim of a crime or a witness to a crime? She answered no. So let's see what she says about this. And again, this is what Peterson says. This is her opportunity during voir dire, like every other juror out there when we hand out written questionnaires, for you to tell us you know, information, if you've been involved in a lawsuit, or if you're a party to a victim, or if you were a victim or a witness or a party to a lawsuit, we want to know about that because we want to make sure that you can be impartial in this case. And if it has anything to do with the underlying case, you know, the restraining, I'm sorry, the domestic violence case where she was beaten by her boyfriend, juror number seven was beaten by her boyfriend while she was pregnant. You know, and Scott Peterson is accused of and was convicted of killing his pregnant wife. You know, does that show bias by concealing this information, by not being forthcoming is what Peterson is alleging. Therefore, she violated his right to a fair trial because this shows that she concealed, so she was biased. All right, let's look at what she said. Her declaration.
Here's her declaration by juror number seven. That's Rochelle Nee. So let's go through it. I, juror number seven, declare as follows. She, she signed this under penalty of perjury. And by the way, all the answers that you give in jury service, jury selection, voir dire, those are all, and these jurors were repeatedly admonished, the Peterson jurors were repeatedly admonished regarding perjury. They were told that their answers were under oath. Okay, and you know, they were facing perjury if they lied about it. So anyway, that's probably also why she's asking for immunity and is probably gonna get immunity when she takes the stand in this hearing. Um, okay, so juror number one, I mean juror number seven. Declare as follows, I have personal knowledge of the blow, of the blow, and if called to testify as a witness, I would and would competently testify to the facts set forth in this declaration. I was summoned by San Mateo Superior Court pursuant to a jury summons in March of 2004. At the time I was employed at his teller at Stanford Credit Union, my highest educational attainment was high school and I had no training as a lawyer or paralegal. She's going to get it. She's getting to the part to say that she, you know, misunderstood the question. Didn't, didn't interpret it as lawyers do. Okay. So number three, at the time I was employed as a teller. Number four, I was provided with a long prospective juror questionnaire containing 116 questions. And by the way, it was 20 pages long. Number five, I responded to the questionnaire candidly, truthfully, and to the best of my ability. Question number 54, which is the one I just read you, asked whether or not you've been involved in a lawsuit. And if yes, were you a plaintiff, defendant, or both? I read the two subparts together, but they were labeled as being part of the same question. I have never been a plaintiff or a defendant in my memory, to my memory, and therefore placed X in the response. In other words, she said no. Because I answered no to 54A, I left the question whether or not she was a party to a witness to a trial. She left that blank. At the time that I answered these questions together and to the right in the middle of the 20-page questionnaire, I understood the lawsuit to mean and refer to a suit for money or property. I don't think that the question was in reference to any other appearance in court. In other words, she's saying that she strictly interpreted lawsuit to mean lawsuit for money and property, not having anything to do with the restraining order, going to court to get a restraining order. She didn't consider that a lawsuit. She didn't consider the domestic violence case regarding with her boyfriend have anything to do with the lawsuit because it wasn't about money or property. She also interpreted the uh, vandalism case against the ex-girlfriend of her boyfriend regarding the slashing of the tires. That was not a lawsuit in her mind. She answered this questionnaire according to this declaration, truthfully and honestly. Okay, so what else did she say? In number 11, I'm not a lawyer. Therefore, she didn't, she didn't, she didn't interpret it as lawyers do. I have no legal education. So my understanding of the word lawsuit at the time that I filed the form excluded other types of court proceedings. I also looked at the language in 54, which referred to plaintiff and defendant to confirm my understanding of the questionnaire. I was not asked to clarify the written response by the judge or either of the parties. No one followed up with me to explain what the word lawsuit meant. No one defined the word lawsuit. They filled out these questionnaires by themselves. There wasn't anyone else to ask, you know, what does lawsuit mean? Does this mean that or does that mean, you know, these jurors, jurors typically do the best they can and they answer these questions. There's a lot of stress when you're called in as a juror and sometimes things get missed and I'm sure that's what the prosecution's gonna argue in the hearing. At the time that I was summoned, I was a, my employer provided me with two weeks of pay in the event of my jury service. This is where it gets interesting. And this is where I think this might turn the case. During the jury selection process, I was brought into the courtroom alone, just as other jurors before and after me to answer questions. So it's when the attorneys have the right to ask you questions. So they're asking her 
by herself, you know, these questions. The judge began to excuse me from jury service because her employer would only pay her for two weeks of service. I th she got up, she thanked the judge, got up and walked out. Was it, she was walking out of the courtroom, what happens? Mark Garagos goes to the judge. Before I could exit the courtroom, the attorney for Scott Peterson, Mark Garagos, the lead attorney in the Peterson murder trial, interrupted her leaving her departure and asked the judge to inquire about me further instead of excusing me right away. The judge decided to keep me in the jury pool after Mark Garagos made his request. So what happened there? She told the judge, basically I have a financial hardship. My employer is only going to pay me for two weeks. The judge excused her. She said, thank you. She got up. Mark Garagos said, whoa, judge, I want to inquire about the financial hardship. He went on to ask her, you know, basically, does she carry the load? She said, no, my, you know, my boyfriend carries the load. So he overcame the financial hardship excuse. In other words, she said that her boyfriend could basically shoulder the financial cost of her serving as a juror. So she was an excuse. She was put back in the pool. During the jury selection process, okay, let me get to, let's see, 16. I answered all the questions that were asked to me by the judge and the prosecutor and the defense attorneys. I clarified my oral responses when I was asked to do so and an opportunity I was not given when I filled out my juror questionnaire. She wasn't asked any other questions about those specific questions, you know, her saying no. There wasn't any other information that I asked about. I don't remember, number 17, being orally questioned about my answers. She wasn't asked about those answers. At no time during jury selection did any court case in which I was involved in cross my mind. So as she's filling out the questionnaires, it doesn't occur to her that lawsuit relates to a restraining order that a lawsuit relates to domestic violence case, that she had been a plaintiff or a defendant in any of those. It doesn't occur to her. According to her declaration, according to her probably testimony at the hearing, it never occurred to her to bring up any of those other, the restraining order, the vandalism, or the TRO. Nor did anyone ask her anything that, any question came out, that led her to think about those things. All right. She said again, 18, at no time during the jury selection process did any court case in which I was involved cross my mind. Never occurred to her that those questions related to or could have related to the domestic violence or the restraining order. Whether or not that's truthful, whether or not you find that she's credible, that's another story, right? The judge is going to make that call. Number 19, though I did not recall this at the time of jury selection or during trial, it never occurred to her during the seven months trial, never occurred to her to bring this to the judge's attention. She's hearing testimony about what happened to Lacey. Lacey was pregnant. What happened to Lacey and to Connor never occurs to her regarding her Domestic violence, being beaten, is pregnant. We'll have to see how that plays out. I did request a restraining order against a woman named Marcella Kinsey in November 2000. 2000. That was the ex-girlfriend of her boyfriend at the time who found out that he was with juror number seven. So Kinsey goes over to her house I think allegedly kicks in the door, yells at her, and then apparently follows her. And also, Kinsey was accused of slashing the tires of her boyfriend's car. So none of that is disclosed during voir dire, during jury selection on the questionnaires, or during the trial. The restraining order, number 20, the restraining order request was made because Miss Kinsey came to came to the home where I lived and caused the disturbance, which is what I just talked about. At the time, my boyfriend, Eddie Whiteside, was the ex-boyfriend of Marcella Kinsey. She was not happy with the current arrangement and came to my apartment to confront me about it. I sought a restraining order because of that behavior. 
I did not hire an attorney. I filed the petition myself. Since I was not a lawyer, I attempted to fill out the petition to the best of my ability. I did not and still do not personally know what resulted of the Kinsey's behavior that night she disturbed my, uh, when she disturbed my peace. I did not testify against her in any criminal action. She's, re she's referring to the vandalism case, the slashing the tires case, because Kinsey was charged with vandalism relating to her boyfriend's car, not her car. So whether or not she was a victim, the victim was the boyfriend's car, right? I did not testify against her in any criminal action and cannot state with any level of certainty whether her actions resulted in any conviction or otherwise. Based on the fact that I didn't participate, I did not consider myself a victim of the crime. I still, still don't. I never sought to prosecute Kinsey for behavior for that very reason. So regarding the slashing of the tires, she doesn't consider herself a victim of that. That was, she's probably going to say Eddie's car, right? I did not interpret the circumstances leading to the petition for the restraining order as a crime. So she went and got a restraining order against Marcella Kinsey to keep her from harassing her because she was now with Kinsey's ex-boyfriend. So when juror number seven went and got a restraining order, she didn't consider herself to be a plaintiff or a defendant or participated in a trial, or even a victim of a crime. I did not consider the, I did not interpret the circumstances leading the petition for the restraining order as a crime, and I still don't. She then in 24, she says, minor uh, shoving matches, raising of voices, and other undignified means of communicating frustration do not stick out to me, let alone cause me to feel victimized. She didn't feel like she was a victim. So when she reads, have you ever been a victim of a crime? She doesn't consider herself a victim. So anything that's happened to her, I'm sure is what the DA is going to say. Anything that's happened to her, she doesn't consider herself a victim. So that question didn't apply to her, even regarding the TRO or the domestic violence case. She doesn't see herself as a victim. Number 25, I have been involved in many loud verbal disagreements. I've never considered myself a victim. She's saying it right here. And I don't know whether lawyers or judges would agree or disagree with my opinion. Number 26, by way of example, I recall getting in a heated argument. November 2001, this is the domestic violence case. Number 27, during the argument, he threatened and did call the police. I did not call the police and I don't consider... Did not consider doing so because it did not consider his behavior to be a crime. Well, Eddie White, Whiteside was charged with five counts, causing traumatic injury to his girlfriend, corporal injury. Uh, there was also a battery and false imprisonment of Rochelle Nice and also a child abuse because she was pregnant at the time, Rochelle Nice was. And then another battery charge. He pled to count five, the battery charge, sent to domestic violence counseling. I was a former domestic violence prosecutor. So anyway, sent to domestic violence counseling. His gun, he had to surrender his gun. He had a no contact order with Rochelle Nice. The judge imposed it for a period of three years. He was, his bail was $25,000. This was a pretty serious case. And she, she says, because she wasn't involved in it, she never testified. She didn't uh, uh, talk to the police. She didn't call the police. She didn't consider herself a victim, and she didn't consider his vi his behavior of his battering her, false imprisonment, and child abuse. She didn't consider that to be a crime. So therefore, when she's asked, have you been a victim of a crime, she answers no. Okay, so... Again, this is all just my opinion, my interpretation. I could be wrong. All right. During the argument, okay, he threatened to call the police, blah, blah, blah. Okay, 28. Now, nonetheless, the police arrived at her residence, her house. She did not call them and did not believe that they would alleviate this situation. Well, that's kind of interesting for a victim or an alleged victim. Somebody involved in domestic violence to say, 
case to say you didn't believe that that would alleviate the situation. Calling the police. Okay. I refused to allow them into my residence, and I did not cooperate with any investigation. Well, I can tell you as someone who prosecuted many domestic violence cases, this is not unusual behavior. You know, sometimes victims don't want the police involved because they don't want to escalate the behavior. They think it escalates. They don't want to be, um, you know, have to be retaliated against if they do say anything. And that's why a lot of times victims recant. So anyway, um, number 29, I didn't seek any assistance from law enforcement that night. She didn't talk to the police that night. He was arrested and he was charged. I was never consulted by law enforcement or any court regarding the incident. No one followed up with me to address the incident or inquire if a crime had been committed or otherwise consulted me about any decision to reject or prosecute a criminal offense. Well, I have to say, as a domestic violence prosecutor, um, what? It's not a... Cases are prosecuted. The reason cases are prosecuted, um, we don't... We don't ask the victim whether or not we shouldn't be asking the victim whether or not they want to prosecute the case. I mean, because we all understand the dynamics of the threats and the intimidation, right? That victims are told not to prosecute, not to cooperate by their abusers. So I find it interesting, and maybe I'm off base here. I find it interesting that this would appear in a declaration. And again, these declarations are usually written up um, you know, maybe Michelle Neese put this together, maybe an attorney put this together, but to consult me about rejecting or prosecuting a criminal offense. I, well, I don't know about that language. But anyway, she's basically saying she didn't have any involvement in it. No one told her it was a crime. So again, how would she know? So this is a case where her boyfriend basically pled no contest. She wasn't involved. They didn't, they didn't have a hearing. They didn't have a trial. He pled in this case to no contest. So she wasn't involved. Okay, number 30. No one has ever con contacted me about this incident and never crossed her mind. Again, the domestic, she's telling you, the domestic violence case with her ex-boyfriend never crossed her mind during jury, jury selection in the Peterson case. This incident did not stick out to me as anything out of the ordinary. Well, that's pretty sad nor did it ever cross my mind when I was responding to the juror questionnaire. Had it crossed my mind or had I been asked about it, I would have immediately disclosed. She's saying that she would have, she would have disclosed this. At no time during or after the Peterson trial did I ever for a moment harbor any personal animus towards Scott Peterson, nor was I biased against him or in favor of the prosecution. She's telling us point blank she had no bias against Scott Peterson. None. At the time of, before the case, at the time of the case, or after the case. She's telling us she had no bias. So how is Peterson going to prove that otherwise? Number 32, I did not purposely withhold any information from the court during the jury selection process. I have had countless unpleasant experiences in my life. It's also very sad. Those outlined above did not cross my mind during any portion of the jury selection process or during the trial. They did not play any role in my evaluation of the evidence or my verdicts. So it's an unpleasant experience. It doesn't stick out in her mind, the domestic violence or the restraining order. That happens in her life at that time. Those were unpleasant experiences, so it wouldn't stick out in her mind. Of course, the... Peterson is going to say, wait a minute, that's the very conduct that Lacey Peterson, you know, she was pregnant and she was subjected to violence. You know, the jury found that Scott Peterson killed her and Connor. Isn't that similar to what Lacey Peterson was going through? That's what the Peterson is probably going to be arguing at the hearing. I did not form any conclusions regarding the evidence in this case until I was called into the jury deliberation room. She's telling us she didn't discuss any of this outside with anybody. 
And she didn't discuss any of this until they all came together in jury deliberations in the jury room and started delivering, which is what they're supposed to be doing. I recall discussing the evidence with the remaining jurors before a unanimous verdict was reached. 34, I have an abiding conviction that the charges, somebody didn't prove this. But anyway, number 34, I don't really see how this applies. Anyway, so she signs it under penalty of perjury, which is why she's asking, potentially, I mean, she's asking for immunity in case someone wants to charge her with perjury. If they think that something that she says is untruthful and she's lied, then she could be facing a perjury charge. So that's why she asked for immunity probably out of an abundance of caution. Anyway, here's her signature. She signed it December 10th, 2020. So this declaration is telling us what her side of the story is. She didn't see herself as a victim. So that question regarding whether or not I've been a victim didn't apply to her. She answered no. She didn't see that she was ever involved in a lawsuit, the restraining order, the domestic violence. Those weren't lawsuits to her because she only saw lawsuits relating to money or property, not having anything to do with domestic violence or restraining orders. She also didn't see the domestic violence behavior as a crime. So it's so a tough, you know, this is what, this was what was in her mind when she made, when she filled out this questionnaire. So did she conceal information? Is she a stealth juror? Or is this a witch hunt to blame it on juror number seven so they can get Scott Peterson's conviction thrown out? Is it an honest mistake that she didn't, she didn't interpret lawsuit as lawyers do or as other people might? Is it an honest mistake or did she conceal information? Did she have a bias against Scott Peterson? to amount to prejudicial misconduct. And that's the question this judge has to decide. But here's her, style, her side of the story. Here's her declaration. No doubt she's gonna be cross-examined on this declaration. You know, no doubt they're gonna be asking a ton of questions about what she meant by what she said in this declaration and what happened during the time that she was filling out the questionnaire. I can tell you there's many cases out there you know, by the California Supreme Court, you know, that failing to disclose may not be enough to be prejudicial misconduct to throw out a conviction. And again, that's up to the judge whether or not this declaration comes in as evidence and whether or not um, the testimony that Rochelle needs, juror number seven, amounts to bias or any other evidence. And again, the judge looks at what we call, what lawyers call, totality of the circumstances. You know, her declaration, her interview with People Magazine, the book, We the Jury, what were the statements in there? What were the statements that she made to fellow jurors? All of that we're gonna be finding out. So take a look at my other videos. I did one on um, the witnesses that Peterson intends to call and the evidence that Peterson intends to present at the hearing. So take a look at those um, as we all prepare, or at least me, as we all prepare for the hearing coming up on February 25th. So thank you very much for watching. Please like and subscribe and share this video. Um, let me get, let me do this here. Yeah, let's do it this way. So please like and subscribe and share my video. Thank you very much for watching and please leave your comments. I look forward to reading them. And I probably will put, be putting together further. I wanna do a video on um, the DA's uh, witnesses and exhibits too. So again, thank you very much for watching.